Let me ask you something. Has your doctor ever taken out the measuring tape to measure? Wait, no, no, not to measure that. Uh, oh boy, this went off the rails fast. New record, to measure your waist. That's what we were trying to get to, to measure your waist. The circumference of your abdomen, the edge to edge of your belly button valley and beyond. To infinity and beyond. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to a, another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. Today, we're going to talk about how this simple and rarely used measurement may be one of the most underrated markers of metabolic health. And if your doctor doesn't measure it, like mine, it's something that you, as part of owning your health, can measure at home. Setting you up for some of those legendary NSVs, non-scale victories. Now, I'm not saying this is the tell-all, be-all measurement of health, as it most certainly is not. But it has built a compelling case to be relevant, specifically as it pertains to living our healthiest life as long as possible, AKA longevity, which we focus on exclusively here. So in the next 10 minutes and 10 seconds, we're gonna take a look into why waist circumference is more relevant than BMI, what exactly it tells us, how exactly we measure it, and some practical ways to get it moving in the direction you want it to go. Packed agenda, I know. Better get the loose jeans on for this one. Now, before we begin, let me preface this conversation with this. In no way should this measurement be your sole indicator of health. There is simply no one data point that gives us the full story. In reality, our health is kind of like a Game of Thrones book. There are many sub-stories with many characters, waging war or forming secret alliances all at the same time. But instead of the motto, winter is coming, it's metabolic syndrome is coming. And the only one who could take out the Night King is you. I wonder what else Game of Thrones can explain perfectly. Other notable measurements, which we are not going to be diving into today, but are important, include full blood and lipid panels, inflammation measurements, insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance tests, vitamin and mineral status, gut health assessments, sleep data, stress tests, overall physical function, and that's just a few of them. The list can go on and on depending on how deep you want to dive or really what you're trying to solve. And if you're interested, you can check out some new cool ways and new tech that researchers are using to gauge our biological health and age. Video just dropped right here. But let's say you can't venture that deep. Many of us can't. All these tests are cool, but the costs add up. And for a lot of it, insurance simply doesn't cover, especially without reason. This is where the basic and underrated metric of waist circumference can be a useful tool. A tool that is proving to be more valuable than the age old metric that was purposely left off the previous list. Body mass index or BMI. Here is why I am not a fan of BMI. And we've talked about this a little bit here and there on this channel. Gauging health in an overall population isn't easy. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And here's an example why. 22% of individuals with obesity are metabolically healthy and have normal lifespans, while up to 40% of normal weight adults harbor metabolic dysfunction that is similar to that found in obesity. This includes conditions such as type two diabetes, dyslipidemia, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and cardiovascular disease. Meaning a lot of these people look normal, or somewhat healthy, but have metabolic dysfunction going on on the inside. And here is a staggering stat in the US that reiterates that exact point. 88% of US adults exhibit metabolic dysfunction, while only 65% of the adult population is classified as obese or overweight. You see what I'm talking about? BMI doesn't work for a number of reasons. The main one being the context that it fails to assess. Just using height and weight and calling it a day tells you absolutely nothing about one's true health. 
aka what is really going on at the cellular and metabolic level. BMI is really only a metric that is good for making sense of a broad population's health status. And that's it. P.S. I just calculated my BMI and who would have thunk? Overweight. Now, you might and rightfully should ask, how the hell does a potentially simpler metric waist circumference do any better? And it's a necessary question. Well, because it is a proxy of something that we know is bad. Something that is highly associated with cellular and metabolic dysfunction. And that something is called visceral fat. Because we know not all fat is created equal. This is the type of fat that accumulates in the abdomen. The fat that is a byproduct of environmental stressors an excess of the wrong type of energy and the steady impairment of cellular and metabolic function that accelerates over time. Visceral adiposity is the condition where normal lean organs, such as the liver, pancreas, intestines, and even the heart accumulate fat. And unlike its subcutaneous counterpart, which is stored on the outskirts of the body, this fat is not a law abiding metabolic citizen great movie. And that would be a hell of a sequel. It is metabolically damaging, inflammation inducing, and organ impairing, leading to the acceleration of more dysfunction and ultimately disease. NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a prime example. This is where the liver becomes metabolically sick. It can't keep up with the constant energy intake and defaults to storing fat locally instead of exporting it to subcutaneous stores. The results, a fatty liver, liver damage, and scarring. Now picture this happening to all the other organs, like the pancreas, intestines, and cardiovascular system. Nonetheless, all happening at the same time. Welcome to the 21st century metabolic dilemma. Yikes, I know. So what's thought to be the cause of this suboptimal fat accumulation? Most experts point to the usual suspects. Continuous consumption of an ultra-processed diet, lack of activity, poor sleep, hormone disruption, excess stress, and environmental toxins. All of this has established visceral fat accumulation as a marker for both morbidity, the state of being diseased, and mortality, the state of you get it. And interestingly enough, circling this back to BMI, the data shows that although the prevalence of obesity measured by BMI has plateaued in some countries, the prevalence of abdominal obesity measured by waist circumference has generally increased, thus delineating it from BMI. So what else does some of the data have to say? Back in 2017, the International Atherosclerosis Society and International Chair of Cardiometabolic Risk met to discuss the importance of abdominal obesity as a risk factor for premature atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease in adults. There, they summarized that the evidence from BMI alone was not sufficient to properly assess, evaluate, or manage the cardiometabolic risk associated with an increase in adiposity. And guess what they did? They recommended that waist circumference be adopted as a routine measurement in clinical practice. Such a simple measurement, and I wonder how many doctors are actually doing it. So I bet you're wondering, how well exactly has this proxy fared in terms of predicting disease, morbidity, and mortality? Let's take a look. First, Research has found that adults with a larger waist circumference are at greater risk of premature death compared to those with a normal waist size. This study that looked at data from 650,000 adults found an estimated decrease in life expectancy for the highest waist circumference participants of approximately three years in men and five years in women. And this effect was independent of other risk factors, such as age, BMI, physical activity, smoking history, and alcohol use. Interesting. Other data that looked into the association between BMI, waist circumference, and risk of death among over 359,000 adults from nine countries found that for a given BMI in men and women, the risk of death increased by 17% in men and 13% in women 
for every five centimeter increase in waist circumference. I guess size does matter. Now here's the thing, and what makes this measurement kind of really imperfect. Remember that stat I threw out earlier? 88% of US adults exhibit metabolic dysfunction, while only 65% of the adult population is classified as obese or overweight. Yeah, that one. This means that waist circumference compared to the general population probably will not raise the red flag for those people who look physically normal, but have dysfunction brewing on the inside. So the best way to use this measurement, just like most other personal data points that you collect, is to baseline yourself and to keep a running tab, in this case of your waist. Observe if you're putting on weight, inches, and where it's going. Your hips, your thighs, your badonka donk, or your waist. Remember, not all fat is created equal. And as you could have guessed, the easy and less reliable way to proxy this is using the waist size on your pants. If they're going up consistently, one of two things are happening. You're either getting those thigh, quad, and gluteus maximus gains by crushing it at the gym and thus need custom clothes, or your waist is growing. And if your waist is consistently growing, odds are your risk for metabolic dysfunction may be too. So with that, what are some of the waistline measurements that you need to know? Well, the beautiful thing here is the numbers, like always, need to be confusing and they vary depending on what health overseeing body you ask. For this, we'll turn to Dr. Robert Lustig, who has been a pioneer in the field of treating metabolic dysfunction for decades and has gone through basically all of the research there is to go through on the topic. Author of a few great books, by the way, as well. He suggests from all the data that he reviewed that a waist circumference under 102 centimeters for men and under 88 centimeters for women are good numbers to target. And if you're wondering, here's how you measure it. Locate your hip bone on your abdomen, wrap a measuring tape around your body at this level, make sure it's snug, but not too snug. Mark the length and measure it. There, you can decide if you want to put it on the ground and start doing like hops over it Tabata style. I'm just kidding. But seriously, if you want like a whole bunch of Tabata workouts, got hundreds of them. Another measurement that can be used is waist to hip ratio, which can help determine if one has excess belly fat. This is calculated by dividing your waist measurement by your hip measurement. And the guidelines here are to have a ratio under 0.85 for women and under 0.95 for men. And now that I, you know, got all this information fresh in my head and I circle back to literally that opening statement, I don't think I've ever once had a doctor make this measurement. I've only had it measured at the tailor, but I have been identified as being overweight several times. So at the very least, stay woke on this simple measurement yourself so you can celebrate those NSVs, baby. Finally, what can you do to shrink that abdominal fat? if it needs shrinking. Here's the good news. Remember that less than optimal visceral fat, the fat that's linked to chronic metabolic disease? Yeah, that one. It happens to be the first to dissipate when you start making meaningful lifestyle changes. What type of change? Well, the type of changes that we talk about here on a weekly basis and have dedicated playlists for on this channel. The type of changes that get you operating efficiently at the cellular and metabolic level. The ones focused on the inside, optimizing sleep, because basically everything is impaired with a lack of it, or when your circadian rhythms, your inner sleep-wake cycles are disaligned. Focusing on eating more real high-quality foods, which is the opposite of modern-day societal eating habits. Moving that badonka donk in an intentional and methodical way each and every day. Walking is a great starting point, but adding some type of strength training is super beneficial to improve metabolic and cellular function, limiting the environmental and household toxins, and not taking unwarranted pharmaceuticals, because a lot of them affect our body and our tens of trillions of microorganisms, our gut buddies, in a lot of different ways. And we can't forget becoming more biodiverse and reconnecting the deep innate biological cues we receive from going outdoors and getting a little dirty. 
numerous epidemiological and randomized controlled trials have demonstrated that a reduction in waist circumference is highly possible and can be very much achieved through good lifestyle habits and solid routines. But with all that being said, you got to realize that you are playing the bigger game here. The game of optimizing your pretty cool meat suit. The game of optimizing your five pound mushy membrane. The game of taking back ownership of your most valuable asset. A game that no one measurement can properly tell you. Unless, well, no, 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 not, not even that one. You know what? We're, we're just going to end it there. Production team, wrap it up. And go get those non-scale victories. I want to hear about them in the comments.